Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Welcome all. Thank you for registering with Future Pathways. Today's lecture title is General Surgery Residency in the USA, given by Dr. Hassan. If you guys have any questions during the lecture, make sure you write them in the Q&A box and we'll be answering them during the Q&A session at the end of the lecture. Dr. Hassan, whenever you're ready, may you please begin. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the invitation. Is my voice clear so I can make sure? Yeah, it's clear. So uh, my name is Hassan Meshbari. I'm a, a teacher assistant from Jazz Zen University and I'm currently doing my trauma and acute care surgery fellowship at Mass General Hospital, Harvard Medical School. So I saw Dr. Abdul Aziz, Dr. Muhammad today, the two previous lectures and uh, some of the topics that I was gonna talk about that they already talked about. So I, during the one hour break, I, I modified some of the slides. Uh, if I did not talk about them, does not make, does not mean that what they said is not important is because I'm trying to focus on different things than they did, but it was an amazing lecture and actually even me, I learned a lot from, from, uh, from them. So uh, what about general surgery in USA? So first of all, some people might agree, some people might not. Uh, first and foremost, surgeons are trained, not born. Uh, just to be able to understand where my advice is gonna come from. I did my medical school in, in Jazz University, did a one year of a teacher assistant, and then I got a scholarship to went to Kaplan. Then I did a preliminary one year general surgery. Then I matched into categorical and currently doing trauma fellowship. So. Uh, just you, so you can understand where my uh, story and advice has come from. So what is the American Board of Surgery? Just to let you know that there's so many different boards in, general sur uh, in surgery overall in the United States. So I'll talk about one by one in a very quick fashion. So the American Board of Surgery has two residency under it. So the general surgery residency and the vascular surgery residency. Although the vascular, they've been trying for years to separate themselves from the general surgery but they, till now it's not successful. So they're still under the general surgery board, uh, the American board of general surgery. So the remaining, as you can see here, the pediatric surgery, surgical critical care, complex oncology, hand and hospice. These are fellowship under that board, uh, that you can get a board certification if you did fellowship. And all of these are uh, approved by the American board of surgery. What about the vascular surgery in US? So there's three pathways to become a vascular surgeon in the uh, in the United States. So one, you can do the independent pathway, which is you do five years of general surgery. And at the end, you apply for a two years separate vascular surgery and you become, uh, if you take the boards, you become board certified in both. Then the other pathway is called the uh, fast track. So for example, if you want to a place that has that fast track, that's mean after you do four years of general surgery, you actually, does do not need to do the chief year, the fifth year surgery residency uh, anymore. You just basically go immediately into a fellowship in vascular surgery. So they call the fast track four plus two. And actually after these total of six years, you can be board, you become board eligible in both general surgery and vascular surgery. And, and if you took the board exam and you passed, you become board certified in both. Or you can go directly to the integrated zero plus five, which is basically you go immediately for a five years of uh, vascular and you only become board certified in the vascular surgery, not the general surgery. What about the American Board of Thoracic Surgery? So there's, again, if you wanna become a cardiothoracic surgeon in the United States, there is also a three pathways. You can do again, the five years general surgery plus two to three years. Uh, for example, you do two to uh, the first two years in uh, thoracic, uh, cardiothoracic, then your third year, you have to subspecialize. Either you want to do a more focus on cardiac portion or you want to do a more focus on the thoracic surgery portion. And the other way, uh, the other pathway is the integrated pathway, which is again six, it's just that separate thing. You just immediately go to a six years of cardiothoracic surgery residency. And there is, as I said before, in the vascular surgery, there is also a fast track that you can do a four years of general surgery and stay in the same residency program and do an extra three years in the cardiovascular, uh, cardiothoracic, and you become a board certified, board eligible in both. And you can actually, if you pass the uh, board exams, you become board certified on the uh, on both of them. What about plastic? So again, you can do a three years after five years of general surgery and you become board certified in both, or you can do immediately an integrated six years residency 
and you become uh, board certified only in plastic surgery. So these are the boards, just try to summarize them. So for those who, it doesn't matter whether general surgery or not. So you guys have an understanding about the different fellowships and understanding about the different residency that you can go immediately in the United States. Okay, so what is the difference between categorical versus preliminary positions, which is different than Canada and in, in, in Saudi and other residencies. So the preliminary position, it's a one year contract with no obligation to the residency to accept you for a categorical. So if you accept it in the categorical, that's mean you are staying in the same residency for the entire five years until you finish your residency and, mat and uh, uh, graduate from that program. While the preliminary year, it's only one year, like kind of contract and commitment. And actually during that year, you apply for either a categorical or a, and a second year preliminary, which is I'm going to talk about it more in the next few slides. So advantages of preliminary position, there are actually more positions every year and actually almost 130 to 135 spots every year uh, are still empty. And they do not fail because people are hoping to go into categorical because if they want into preliminary, that's mean another year of application and, and stress and all that things. So you always aim to get into categorical position, but also at the same time, uh, make sure you click the preliminary position spot as an IMG just to increase your chances. All right, so what about those preliminary? How many of them actually match into categorical? This is a one single center study that done in the VA, looking into the outcomes of their preliminary surgical residents and where they end up after that year. So here they accepted a 57 PGY1 preliminary residents over many different years. And if you look focus all on the, uh, those who end up into categorical, only eight of them in, went into general surgery and some went to, uh, four went to ortho one. So out of this 57, only eight people got matched into a categorical. Uh, 22 of them did a second year of preliminary. So the US system now allow only a two years of preliminary positions, either your PGY1 or PGY2. Uh, and uh, that's, and, and that, those are the only available options. The, and you can see here 17 actually completely switched their uh, their speciality. N keep in mind, not all the people who apply for a preliminary position, that means they did not match. During the year I did uh, my preliminary year, I had a one who is already planning to do radiology. And if you, if you did radiology, you need to do a preliminary year, either a transitional year into internal medicine or preliminary year into surgical. So not all the people who do your preliminary they in indeed need or want to do a general surgery. Just keep that in mind. Some of them need, want to do urology. Some of them want to do OPGAN, but they did not match into those residencies. So they cut, at least they want to add one year of experience. So that's why they apply for a preliminary uh, year. So what is the difference between PGY1 preliminary and PGY2 preliminary? So if you accept, if you, during your preliminary PGY1, you have four options. Either you apply again into the ERAS match for a PGY1 categorical position, or you apply for a PGY2 preliminary position, or actually if there is an empty spot and you're lucky, uh, you can get accepted for a PGY2 categorical, whether that is at the same place. Like for example, some centers accept uh, six preliminary and every year they pick one of those six to stay for a second year categorical. So. And remember that you can apply at the same site or you can apply into other places. But also don't forget, some people do not want to uh, apply for a PGY2 uh, preliminary and they could not find a PGY2 categorical positions. They actually go for a one year of research. And one of my friends who is a preliminary general surgeon from Saudi did a one year of preliminary. They went for a research year and actually after that match into categorical at the same place that they did he did his research year. What about PGY2? So once you accepted a PGY2 preliminary position, you cannot apply anymore into the match and EROS for a PGY1 categorical. You cannot repeat the year. So you have only three options. Either you find an, a categorical PGY2 position at the same or another centers, or you find an empty PGY2 categorical position, or you go for a research here. So those are the advantages and disadvantages and the options. And I hope you guys understand 
what is the meaning of preliminary by, by now. So what are the resources when you wanna apply for a general surgery? And even if you wanna read about uh, how many residents in this position and how many residents in this center and how many you, residencies overall. So this is called the Green Book, which is the uh, written by the American Medical Association. Another resource is Frida. It's an amazing site, actually give you even the empty positions. So if you are a PGY1 and you're looking for a PGY2 empty spots, some people actually, some programs announce in this site uh, the available empty spots. And also it has the details information about each program, who is the program director, who is the secretary, how many residents they accept every year. Uh, so it's a very, very important resource. And the third one is the, just go directly to the, to the ACGME, the, the Accreditation Council of Graduate Medical Education has the details. That's the center that give the accreditation for a program to be accredited. That's when, uh, uh, if you start reading that this, this is a program is under probation or this pro program lost their certification, it's the ACGME who, do the who does the evaluation and actually granted the, uh, the certification to residency programs in the United States. So what can I do to increase my chance into match into, into, into the United States? So nothing better than actually looking into data. And these are the results of the 2019 NRMP applicant survey. For those who do not know what is the NRMP, NRMP is basically a, an, a, an a site that after you finish your application uh, and you do your interviews at the end of February before the match, you go into the NRMP and actually rank programs. So it's a basically a third party that you go in, you rank the programs that you interviewed at, and the programs also rank you. And uh, the NRMP do the matching and actually tell you on in March where which program you you uh, uh, you matched into. Uh, the when you fill up your rank list or even after, they send you a survey after you match. And some people actually fill that survey and some people not. So these are the results for those who fill up their survey. So here you can see the 10 most important things that they look at into the, uh, in, in, in the applicant. And you can see here, I'll only focus on the IMGs. So don't forget, there is a US citizens who do not accept it into, who, into medical school in the United States. They actually go to the Caribbean or other countries to do a medical school there. So they, they, they named US IMGs, basically mean a US citizen, but they did their medical school in IMGs. And there is a non-US, IMG. So these are this is our category. So I, I want you to focus on these two columns. So what about the median score for step one and step two? So for step one, you can see for those who match, it was 242. And for those who do not match, it's 236. Again, these are only the people who uh, accepted to fill up the survey. So but you can tell that uh, comparingly to the US IMGs, the, the median was 237. So the higher your score in step one, the higher chances you have to get accepted and, and, uh, and matched. What about your USMLE step two score? You can see the average for those who match is 249 and those who did not match is 240. Um, and as you guys know, now the two, the two thousand starting from 2022, there is no more step one score. It's step one is gonna be a pass or fail score. And that's gonna be a really problem for us as an IMGs because one of the chance, one of the good strengths that we have as an IMGs, we usually get a higher score in a step one, which is give us a higher chances. Now, I think they're gonna pay more weight on the, in your CV, but also at the same time, more weight on step two score. So the higher you, you get in your step two score, the, your, the, the higher your chances are. What about research experience and publications? You can see here that the research experience at the average for those non-US IMG who match had at least five kind of projects running, either that done during their medical school or after the medical school. But it's interesting the number of abstracts, presentations and publications, it's in the 15th. That's a really high number that, uh, that I noticed is that uh, uh, 15 was the mean for those who matched into uh, general surgery residency. So looking into my situation, so I, did, I got 237 on my step one. 
which is really low than uh, like than the median. But uh, that's why I matched into a preliminary position. So uh, I wish I got higher score, but that's you know that's that's what I got. But I did not have a uh, research experience of 5.2, or I did not, and I did not have a 15 publication. I had only two at that time, but I did like around four or five presentations internationally. Uh, and I had some volunteer that I'm gonna talk more about. So don't let these numbers scares you. I just want you to understand the importance of steps and important of exper experience and research and presentations. All right, here is the step one score into those who match and did not match, but only in the non-US IMGs. Pay attention that for those who had a score between 251 and 260, uh, the gap between the blue who match and the green that did not match is very small. So for those who, to, who had a 231 or 241 category, their number, the percentage of people who did not match actually higher. It's interestingly that the, the higher you score, the higher your chances to, to get accepted into uh, residency. By mean, that's mean you in, get at least an interview uh, invitation. Here is just the probability of matching. The higher you score in, uh, the higher your chance of match. But comparatively, if you are a US citizen, your chances are higher, even if you guys got the same score. To be able to get into a, an, a, an, an, a, a position, actually you have to have a higher score than US who did their medical school outside the, the United States. It's, whether it's fair or unfair, I'll leave that to you to decide. Just keep that in mind. What about the step two score? Again, uh, the, the gap between those who match and did not match and those who got their scores in the 251 to 260 uh, is small, which indicate that those people who are in that category, they match higher, they have a higher chances of matching. Again, I do not want to scare you guys about the scores, but it's really, really important to have a high score in a step one and a step two. So if you decided into, in medical school to take this exam, you need to dedicate months of tire of hard work and uh, you know and time and to be able to get a higher score because once you pass this test you cannot take it again so if you pass and you got 220 that's it for the rest of your life you are a 220 step one score you cannot change that a research projects uh, again uh, the higher uh, your your uh, projects are like in the category of five or more, they match, but also at the same time, those who even got one or two, they still matched. So it takes into consideration, but it's not an absolute comparingly to the steps. What about publications? Again, the higher you have a publication, the higher your chances of uh, matching. Again, in publications, we talked about abstract and we talked about presentations. That's mean if you present, if you basically applied into one of the conferences in the Saudi or, uh, or outside Saudi, and your presentation got accepted into, uh, uh, your abstract got accepted for a presentation, this is also count. So that's what I mean by five or more, not only publications, but also presentations. What about volunteer experience? Uh, the, even if you have one volunteer experience, it's still really counted. But it's interestingly that even for those who have 10 or more, their chances are not that significantly higher than those who did one. It really takes into account, and, and it's a good talk when if you did a surgical camps or anything like that, it's uh, people will be really interested in getting to know you, but uh, they will understand that you are uh, a globally oriented about this topic. So they take that into consideration. So keep in mind uh, these, uh, these uh, topics. All right, so in summary, at the end of the document, it said uh, IMGs who are successful in matching to their preferred specialty are more likely to rank more programs within their preferred specialty. So there's a, a higher number above 100 uh, residency programs. So you'll find the US graduate, they, they pick 20 programs and they stick to them because they know they're gonna get interviews hard. But for IMG, we apply for 70, 80 programs. Unfortunately, that's the reality, but you have to apply to higher number compared to the US or even US IMGs. And, 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 and you can see here that 
the, the, the more programs you apply for, the higher your chances and to match. Again, number two, higher USMLE step one and step two CS score and being a US citizen. This is nothing we can do about, but if you are a Saudi who born in the US, your chances are higher to match compared to Saudi who did, who did not, even if you guys have the same score. So that's uh, keep that in mind. Uh, again, what is the summary? Higher score in the steps, international observership and electives really take into consideration. I sat down with multiple program directors and I asked them one single question. What is the most feared about IMGs? He said, what we really scared about IMGs is that we don't know how they're gonna fit into the US system or the EMR, EMR which is the electronic medical record and work with the nursing staff. So whenever we see someone who actually did an elective in a, either North America as a Canada or uh, US or even UK, but preferably Canada or US, they become more comfortable, especially if they have a letter from a, from a person here, because that's a, a, an uncertainty and security problem that they had about IMG disappeared because they know that you fit in. They know that you're now aware how the rounds work, how the clinic works, how the nursing staff works, how the uh, operating room and all these uh, small details that they they don't want to, they don't need to teach you anymore. So that put them in ease. So keep that in mind. So try uh, to apply even during medical school and I'll talk to you more about already the previous uh, uh, presenter talked about the advantages and disadvantages and of doing an elective and he really gave and a, and a very good details about it. I don't wanna talk about it in more details. I'm just wanna emphasize the importance of that. Volunteer work is very important and I'll talk more about it. Societies related work. What do you mean by societies related work? Also, I'm gonna show from my experience, uh, what are the things that I did during medical school that helped me to get where I got. Extra degree research experience and publication taken into account, but really reality, one of the most important element that I had or other Saudis had is connections, whether that through SECAM connections or through a Saudi residents who are currently doing their residency program in the United States. So what does SECAM pro provide? So in, if you went to their website, looking into the, in the left, you're gonna go to the medical health science department and you can find a lot of details. One of them is the, what kind of programs, what affiliations they have, the, num the name of the people who got accepted. So uh, I'm breaking them down here. So in the announcement, you can he see here some of really important opportunities, whether you're during your medical school, uh, in your internship, or even after your internship, uh, like the US San Diego program, the University of Alabama at Birmingham, uh, and Birmingham, you have the GW, which is George Washington. You have the Michigan University of Michigan, the Oshner, and uh, the NYP. So these are really important. If you click on them, you're gonna have more details. And I encourage every one of you guys to go and check it out. In the student research, again, more details about these research opportunity and exchange programs. In the summer program is the Summer Research and Medical Enrichment Program in the GWs and most of the people who went there, he, they have really good feedback. And in the acceptance section, you only gonna find so far the 2014, 2015 updated list and they did not update it since then. But one of the things you can look into that is that find out Saudis who matched, where did they match and try to find them either in LinkedIn or a Twitter accounts or, and reach out to them and ask them for advices. So their names are in, the SACAM website. These are the current uh, updated affiliation in the general surgery. Uh, I actually do not know everybody uh, who match into these, but I know for sure uh, there are people in University of Chicago. There's a uh, University of Illinois where I did my residency in Chicago. There is University of Toledo. There's George Washington. There's people in Oshner and uh, uh, what else? Um, and Tuft. So these are the places that I know Saudis in general surgery who matched there. 
just keep this list and you, you can go back to it, but you can find it in the actual website of SACOM. So these connections really help. Uh, some, these, some of these programs have uh, one position dedicated to Saudis who are coming through SECAM, so that most of these positions are in the internal medicine, the radiology, the psychiatry, not particularly in surgery because surgery is very, very competitive, but your chances are basically are competing with other Saudis if you're lucky to go into a place that has dedicated spots for, for Saudis. So your chances are higher because you're only competing with other Saudis. And uh, it, the, the amount of uh, work that Dr. Samar Sagaf who did the affiliations and her team, it was, it's phenomenal. So we owe them a lot of uh, respect. Uh, again, these are the opportunities. You have the US San Diego Health Science International Program. I'm not gonna go into the details about them. There's people who are gonna talk about masters in, the, in USA. So that's a good people to ask them about that. And there's the International Medical Education uh, at the University of Alabama. This is a snapshot from the actual site for the summer research and medical enrichment program. Some uh, people from Saudis who, who attended this program and they got to know people, they had uh, uh, classes, they did some research and actually made a connection that when they apply again after medical school, their chances are higher compared to those who do not, who do they not know. These are some of the places that uh, people matched into in general surgery, like again, George Washington, University of Toledo, the UIC where I did my medical, my surgery residency and University of Chicago. This is the timeline for the application in the United States for the general surgery residency. So in January to March of the year, you make sure you did your CS scores and you schedule because you, before you apply and you submit your application in September, you need to make sure you have all your scores ready and your, uh, your ECFMG certified already. So some places tell you, hey, if you did your test before, you know, before May 1st, we will get your scores before the application. But if you did your, your CS exam after May 1, you will not get your score before the application. So you need to pay attention to that date and make sure you book your exam earlier. In April and June, you buy your token. In July and August, you fill up your applications, you submit your recommendation letter, and in September, after you, you pick up all the residency programs that you wanna to apply to, and you submit your application in September. You have October till January, actually, the interview season. In February, you submit your rank list, and in March, you find out where did you match. And from March to uh, uh, June uh, is the, your preparation and moving to the, the, to the new city that you're gonna go to. And in January, in June, you actually start your residency program. Some people start in July 1st. So this is the timeline that you, I want you to keep in mind. The same timeline every single year with a little bit of modification by days, but the same skeleton. So what is the daily work for a general surgery residents in the United States? So uh, again, the, my friend who is from Canada who did the talk, he did really more details about it. So I'll try to talk in a, in a small details, but it's a 12 hours per day. Uh, in our residency, we started from 5 a.m. to 5 p.m. And by 5 p.m. you do the sign up. Uh, so usually you go home by 6.37. Um, that's the reality in some place. Sometimes you don't go home till nine or eight. It depends on how, how, how busy your service is, but also in the same time, how good you are about finishing tasks and uh, following up the, uh, the, the, the things that they ask you to do and you make sure that everything is done by five. Some places do do the 24 hours. So there is no, there is no the day and nights. You basically come in and you stay till the next day. And then again, another person for the next, uh, for the 24 hours. The ACGME made an 80 hours work limit just to defeat the burnout and uh, protect the residents. And you have to actually log in every week, how many hours you did. You know, reality wise, you always, we always break it. We, we do more, but some programs do not. And some programs, if you actually logged in more than 80 hours, they might put the programs into pro, in, the, in, in problems. So uh, it's the seniors, you find that some of the seniors actually trying to get the resident, their interns early home because they want to make sure that they don't break the eight hours. So it's a, it's a good, it's a better lifestyle compared to previously. You get one day off, you work as six days, 
a week and you have around, you know, 21 to 30 days off a year as a vacation. You get from some, depends, some places every three or four, every four to six days, you do a 24 hour call. And in bus call, you actually stay to round. So you don't like at 5 a.m. when you sign out, you don't go home. You actually have to round, you do some work, and then you get sent home by nine or 10 a.m. So keep that in mind. So it's not like if you sign out at, five and you just go home for med level and seniors uh it's service dependent actually you run the show as the as the the senior in that service you round every day in the morning by yourself with your intern then you actually before the operating start you talk to the attendings and you tell them about your plan and what so you feel sense of independency um basically you discharge the patient who think that you need to be discharged you take home calls, you come in the hospital, see consults in the ER, and you call the attending, and you actually, if you think that the patient needs to go home, you just send them home. And, um, and some of the program programs different, but you develop sense of uh, responsibilities at a younger age. Uh, but again, it's a different program, different experiences. You divide the OR cases into between the team. So if you have two rooms running at the same time, your intern cover one room and you do another room. So you actually operate. Some places as an intern, you do not do many cases, but some places you, as an intern, you actually become first assistant in many cases and, and, and you work with attending side by side. So you develop uh, tactile and experience and actually uh, more skills in that. So I like that uh, system. What about board eligibility? So you have to do a nine, 60 months to be able to sit down for the board. And you have to have an, you have to be ACLS certified. You have to be an ATLS. And there is two exams that you need to take before you sit down for the board. One of them is called the fundamental of endoscopic surgery in which you actually uh, perform uh, endoscopy, whether that's an EGD, like through the mouth or colonoscopy and a, on a mannequin. And you, and basically they show you different uh, pathologies and you need to perform certain tasks and you have to pass the test. If you failed, you, you, can, you need to do it again, but you cannot sit down for the board to, without passing that. And there's another one is called fundamental of laparoscopic surgery. So the reason why they brought in these extra exams is because they wanna guarantee certain level of skills that you need to achieve to be able to be a board certified which is uh, an amazing, but painful in, in a fashion. But, um, you know, uh, after you do them, you understand the, the importance of that. These are the minimum cases you need to do uh, to be able to, to sit down for the board. Here, the total is 850 cases and 200 of them, you have to do them as the fifth year, as in your chief year. And there is 20 of them need to be as a teaching assistant. Interestingly enough, you actually have to do 50 colonoscopy and 35 endoscopy to be able to sit down for the uh, EGD, to be able to sit down for the boards, which is, I found that is interesting. And we actually become very comfortable and skillful in how to manage scopes. So during your remaining year, and even now in my fellowship, I'm for tracheostomy uh, uh, and uh, percutaneous uh, gastrostomy tube placement, all the skills you learned uh, from the upper endoscopy during residency actually help. Here, interestingly enough, they, there is the non-operative trauma, like how to manage patient in the ICU that also you have to log in that you took care of certain number of an ICU patients to be able to be eligible to sit down for the board. So you can see here the variety of cases and even in vascular surgery, the uh, 50 cases in vascular surgery to guarantee that you have the enough basic skills to be able to manage emergency vascular until you call for help. Uh, so I, I appreciate the variety that uh, the U.S. system provide for their uh, uh, training. This is the board certification exam. There is two exams. There is first exam is called the qualifying exam. It's a 300 multiple choice questions. It's a one day exam lasting eight hours. And uh, it's a four sessions, each session 115 uh, minutes. Very painful, very painful exam, but you have to pass the test to be able to sit down for the second exam. And it's a once, one, once a year exam. So if you fail, you have to wait an entire year. Differently than, the US, than, other, than other countries, 
actually you graduate from surgery residency and you actually sit down and find a job and work in a hospital without even being a board certified. You just need to be a board eligible. And the exam is usually one month or two months after you graduate from residency. So you, in US, you literally can have a job without being a board certified and some, and you have seven years after graduation to finish these exams. Uh, if you did not pass them within seven years, a really long time, you have to do the residency again. So if you pass that first exam, you can sit down for the second exam, which is uh, called the certifying exam. It's an oral exam consisted of three consecutive 30 minutes session with uh, either like almost around five, four to five cases per room. A uh, very intense exam and it's frightening actually. And you have to, there's two examiners, one senior, one junior, and it held five times per academic year. And uh, again, it's once up one opportunity per academic year. So if you fail, even if they're remaining five times in that academic year, you have to wait an entire year to apply again for this exam. So thank God I already passed them both and I'm board certified now. So the reason why uh, in the one hour uh, that uh, my pre uh, that uh, I had between the general surgery residency in Canada and the Saudi general surgery, I added some slide regarding my story. And the reason why I added this section, it, it doesn't matter whether you're going to come to US. It doesn't matter where you're going to go to Canada. It doesn't matter where you want to go to Europe. Uh, take whatever you can from the experience. I do believe people who match into general surgery residency in the United States, each one of them has a lot of experience and, and, a, and a sacrifice story because the road into general surgery in the United States is very tough comparingly to the others. Um, not disrespecting other specialty, but uh, you know, going to Kaplan, not knowing whether you're going to pass the exams or not, and what is the score, and going into preliminary year and doing a research year, and you might, might not match and spend four years of your life, then eventually find out that you did not match and you go back home. Have that in mind, uh, you know, to, to decide if that is a, a journey you want to go with. Uh, it's it what, you know, you have to keep that in mind and, and choose whether that's something worth while the fight or not. So I did, I born in, in Sabia, uh, in Jazan. And uh, uh, the first three years uh, of, re of medical school, we were actually were under ja Jamaat al-Malik Abdelaziz. Then after that, we Jazan University created and then we switched to that. So I graduated 2010 and I'm still in training till now. We already 2000. And so, almost 10 years and I'm still in training and I did not finish my fellowship yet. I still have a year and two months. So all my friends are already, you know, consultant in Saudi. And that's something that I kept to keep in mind. And, you know, whether it's worth it or not, it's keep that, you, that's something you have to decide. After that, during the summer. So actually after my third year of medical school, although we did not start medicine and surgery in fourth year, I went to the only surgeon in, uh, in, 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 in the village. And I told him, I wanna come and start working with you in the summer because I wanna see what is, what is meant to be a surgeon. And that's the year that I decided to become a, you know, a surgeon. So don't say it's too early, actually just go for it. And since then, every summer, I did a one month to two month of electives in, uh, in different hospitals in, 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 Sabia, in Sabia or the King Fahd Central Hospital, but all of them were in, 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 in the region. In uh, 2008, we had an actual an exchange program in our university that I, with eight of us from the university, we went for uh, an observership uh, hands-on uh, at University of Illinois in Chicago. Uh, got to meet many people and got a, two letters of recommendation and since then, every year at the end of the year, that was 2008 till 2013, when I applied for residency, I sent an email updating that attending about how am I doing? What are the things going on? And I kept an, a, an, a connection to that person till the day I came to Chicago, actually, before I applied for residency and I visited him and he still remembered me. And he actually every year continued to update my letter of recommendation. So... Uh, don't lose the connections, whether that is as uh, medical students or even into your internship or even a residency. 
I uh, that year I got to know about the IFMSA and I applied and uh, uh, that was an, an, a huge opportunity to open my horizon into different aspects uh, uh, about what is outside of Saudi Arabia. Then uh, that went to created uh, Nadi Lamsa Sahia. After that, uh, through IFMSA, I got the chance to work with the WHO. And uh, from that, I ended up going to different conferences to uh, present uh, our abstracts and presentations. I uh, got involved into public health, which is one of my passion. And all of these things, I learned something at every year. I met new people. And in 2010, as an internship, I actually requested my two electives months to be the last in internship to, to basically learn how much I can. So when I go for my electives in the US, I already have enough skills to show off my skills and, and, uh, and get a more letter of recommendation. So this is me and Abdulaziz Arishi, who is also from my university, who's currently a PGY5 graduating from University of Toledo in general surgery. Both of us, we went to George Washington. We got both of us a letter of recommendations that helped us in application. And I went to, during their internship, I actually got the chance to work with the, uh, uh, the World Assembly of Muslims Youth. And we went to Cameroon, Africa for surgical camp. And after that, I actually reached out to the International Surgical Mission. That's a mission all the way in Colorado in the US. And I reached out to them from Saudi and I actually traveled from, uh, from Saudi Arabia and I just I met them in uh, Northern Samar in Philippines. And that's the entire team who goes there every year. So from learning from IFMSA and other places, I got to know that there is other opportunities and you know that's what uh, made me uh, build up good relationship and I, I and these two volunteers in surgical camp really helped me a lot in every interview I got in the US uh, because they were very happy about that history went to Kaplan after that became the president of the Saudi Arabia, uh, Saudi Arabia club did some work with the United Nation and I worked in three different uh, volunteer organization, all of that during Kaplan. So I did not only just go there and study, but uh, also during between step one, uh, CS, I mean, between CS and CK, I, I met my wife actually in Kaplan and we got married and uh, she sacrificed time and effort to help me. Uh, she's a neurologist right now, actually, to finish training. After that, I matched for a preliminary year. Then well, that's one of the most hardest year I had uh, and I got all the help and the advisors from uh, different attendings and uh, that helped me to, to get a, a more chances to apply to another spot. And I applied for vascular integrated programs. I've applied for categorical surgery and I was lucky enough to stay. We were, although there were four of us who were preliminary year, uh, I was enough uh, happy to, they kept me as the categorical and I repeated my internship year, but as a categorical position, these are, some photos of my friends. And all the things I did during medical school, it just built up the kind of uh, optimism that I wanna do more. So worked up in different societies, took up different leadership positions, became ATLS and asset instructor, all the way to represent the Illinois states in the, uh, uh, the Capitol Hill uh, and the House of Representatives talking about surgical uh, problems and uh, paid problems and gun control and a lot of stuff that. So uh, whatever you do in medical school and the attitude you keep is you will be carried with you all the way. Uh, currently, I'm doing my, uh, my uh, fellowship at Mass General Hospital. These are just the 13 research fellow that they actually take every year for one or two years. It's a great opportunity. So if you're interested in, in doing a, a research year at Mass General Hospital in the acute care surgery department, please let me know and I'll be doing more than happy to help you apply for that uh, for that position we have a great future in, in trauma as a as a as hopefully trauma surgeon back to jazza and after this uh, these are uh, some of the uh, pride future ideas that i see every day that make me excited about going back home mentorship is very important some mentors can be during your medical school some mentors can be during your residency some mentors help you to match into a fellowship so you can have different mentorship for different stages of your life for certain things, some mentors in surgery, some mentors in medicine to teach you other stuff. But always, always, always remember that the first one, the person who helped you to be where you be is your second partner. And the reason for my 
success and it's it's uh it's my wife who's an old jenny who's who helped me during every single step of my life uh, and i owe her uh, eternity to to what i have reached so far is it worth it it's a tough question uh currently you know my wife finished her training and she's actually currently in, in jeddah and with my son so uh, I still have one and a half, one year and two months. And I see my son through a glass screen uh, over a phone every day. Uh, it breaks my heart. Uh, it can make me question myself whether this is something worth it. Uh, you know, not able to see them and only maybe able to see them once a year. Uh, it it makes you doubt yourself, but uh, in encouraging words, you find out from your, you know, your wife and uh, your friends and the, the connection that you are willing to bring with you all the way to Saudi and hopefully everything I got and learned and connection uh, to help my medical students and Jazan and all the other medical students in Saudi. So, uh, you know, I do believe it's worth it. I do believe I learned so much and uh, I appreciated those who are important in my life. And, uh, you know, uh, that's the message that I want to deliver. And with this, I thank the future pathways for this opportunity and uh, I'm open for any questions. Thank you so much, doctor. The lecture was very informative. Um, so we received some questions and I'm, I'll ask you them now. So uh, the first question is, can you please elaborate on the research experience and the difference between the publication, presentation and abstracts? So abstracts, not every abstract e e end up in a manuscript. So some abstract you start writing them just to apply for, uh, how can I say that? Just for uh, presentation uh, or an oral competition or a research competition in a conference. So you apply for a competition. Your abstract only accepted as part of the uh, the uh, the folder uh, of the actual. You know, because some conferences have their own publications just only for the conference, and they can add your abstract. So if you end up not pushing the envelopes and write the entire manuscript and submitting that for publications. It counted as only an abstract, but does not count as a publication. So that's what I meant by abstract versus publication. Publication can be the same abstract, but now you wrote the entire literature review. You did the methods, the, the discussion and the results and got accepted into uh, certain journals and now it's published and it's an indexed journal. Uh, the presentations, I mean by presentation, whether you uh, got to present in an oral competition presentation, on a poster presentation competition, or even in a grand round. So uh, in medical school, the, 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 the small lectures that you give as a part of your education actually does not count. But if you're, for example, uh, asked to go to a different university or different school or to give, uh, for example, a certain club, like for example, Nadi Tullab al Tib fi Jamaat al Malik Saud, and 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 you're not part of them, but they ask you to come and present the lecture uh, as an invite speaker. That count. You you basically did a presentation, not part of your medical education uh, or curriculum fil fil Jamaa fil Kulliya. So th these are the uh, uh, the what count and what not. And but the importance of having a mentor is that when they review your CV and actually you talk to them about, oh, does this count? He will tell you. And I was like, mm, no, that doesn't count. Or this, yes, you can. Or this, make sure you write it, rewrite that way. So I had mentors since I was a third year medical student. And every year I gained different mentors and I asked them and I still have their connection. So uh, that's the job of your mentor to tell you what is the difference uh, between each one of those three. Okay, um, the second question is the CS exam is now suspended. Do you know how this will affect educational commission for foreign medical graduates, certification and future applications? So what they are doing right now, they're actually discussing it and they will write down exactly, they take, they know that that's, that's a huge problem. And they know that people were not able to apply for it. So uh, <clears throat> before the application open up in September, I'm sure they're gonna, uh, basically they might open the application, but uh, they would not let you start your residency or at least rank. Let's say for example, so uh, you submit your rank in, in, in February, okay? But the application you submitted in September. 
So they might allow you to apply, you might allow you to interview, but they are waiting for you to tell them that you did your CS and, and actually pass that before they rank you in February. So that's one of the things that they might do. They, uh, they will take you and they will tell you, hey, by the way, we will not rank you if you did not send us by February that you passed your CS. So that's, uh, and uh, I think that's what they are thinking about, but to tell you the truth, that's still in the air. Uh, and if you follow them, they will uh, write down exactly these details. But I, that's what I, some of the program directors told me right now that they're gonna do, because I asked them, what are you guys gonna do for those who did not? And that's, they said, we're still gonna interview them, but we're gonna tell them we will not rank you till you send us your CS. Uh, okay. Um, someone asked, is it essential to do an elective in the US or Canada to be able to match in the residency program? It's not. But for example, as I told you that uh, uh, when I asked the program directors, what is the most thing you fear about IMGs? He said for them to fit in uh, into the US system. By them knowing that you did an elective in Canada and US, they're not worried that you know how the round works, how the operating room works, how the, to deal with the nursing staff, your, comfortable with the electronic medical record system and everything like that. But those who matched with me, like some of the Saudis who match into preliminary year have literally no, no, they did not do any rotations in the U S but, uh, you know, it's, uh, you I do believe that if they knew that they, you did not do any electives and they don't know, they might just take you for a preliminary. This is their way is like, Oh, I don't want to, uh, take this guy for or this girl for a five years commitment because I don't know but if I take her only for one year even if she sucks or she's not good uh, I know it's only a one year but I do believe for those who are my friends who match immediately into categorical positions they either did electives a lot of electives in the U.S. or Canada uh, or, or they did a one year of research with them so they spent a year with them they got to know the system they attended their M&Ms they did not elective hands-on as part of the research, but they already know them. They know that they are normal people, they can talk because they know that interview is not enough to tell is this is a guy is a social or not social and he's comfortable with the system. So to answer your question, it's not, but does it count and is really important to have? Yes, but don't let that uh, prevent you from applying. Yeah, but keep in mind that uh, pre preliminary may be a possibility com compared to categorical. Uh, okay, the second question is, what is the effect of GPA on matching into surgical specialties, especially plastics? To tell you the truth, in the U.S., uh, you know, I never had anyone tell me, oh, this is your GPA, we're not going to take you for an interview, or even they brought it in up into any conversation. You, when you submit your EROS, you have to put your GPA. I don't know how they look at it. They really don't look, they don't want it to be bad. But even if your average GPA actually does not make a huge difference. The most important is your scores in UCMLE. Those are the most important. So if you have to compare between a very high GPA and a low step one, it's like there is zero comparison, zero comparison. So don't worry about having a lower GPA to apply, but does it, if you got compared to someone who has a better GPA, they're 100% they're gonna take that guy who have a higher GPA than you if you are both are equal in every single thing else. Uh, okay, um, if I want to do an elective training in North America, when can I do it? And can I do it after or during internship yet? Yeah, so what I did uh, is that when we were making the schedule for the for the internship, uh, there is two months elective or one month elective. So I did once in King Faisal Specialist Hospital in Riyadh, and I did one in the in the U.S. And reason why I did one, I, I when I asked them like, can you please make my elective is the last month of the internship year because I had almost a year to apply for different positions, finish the visa paperwork, and and you know because. According to what my colleague who spoke about Canada, it takes time. It really takes time to apply and get accepted for, a, for a, an observership. So 
you can take it during your uh during your uh what do you call it during your internship but keep in mind is that one is I, I show you guys the timeline for application for uh residency so if you already have your step one and step two now it it, it become more important to know when to do your electives because you want to do your elective and get a lot of the recommendation before you know uh august uh, before i'm sorry before your uh uh, September application. So I'm not sure how, what is the, because I think it's in October to October or something like that in Saudi, the internship, I really don't remember. But if you know that September is the application for uh, residency, you need to do it before that. You need to get at least doing March or May. So, uh, you know, by that time you already gained more experience in, in, in internship and you know how to get numbers, you know how to present in bedside and everything. And then when you go to United States, you still have enough time to impress them and get enough letter of recommendation. So when, when June open up uh, to, to upload your letter of recommendations, you already, you know, you, they're still fresh. They still remember you, did not spend a year away from them, but also at the same time, enough time before the submission. But if you did not have step one or step two at all, it doesn't matter when you do it. So do it the last rotation. Uh, okay, for the last question, uh, it says, how can we get sponsorship for research years and how can we apply? Sponsorship for what exactly? Uh, research, yes. So here's the thing. So you either uh, go through uh, King Abdul is, you know, the same scholarship program, the uh, King uh, scholarship program uh, through the higher education or sponsorship from your uh, from your universe, you know, if you are a teacher assistant, Ma'id for Kulia, it's the sponsorship from that. So it, it's, it doesn't matter if you, either one of them, they will accept you uh, for research. So now I think they're making a lot of changes in SACAM. I'm actually part of the workshop, just trying to get how to increase the chances of currently who are in Saudi when apply to the US is still in progress with Corona, we stopped. So hopefully we can re, re, revisit that. But uh, uh, whether you are uh, under the uh, Beth the Malik or Maid, both of them you you can accept it in research as long as you're the one who's gonna be applying. So you're gonna follow all these websites that I provided you guys with. They follow the SACAM, get the list, submit, go for interview, and when you match these the the, the financial guarantee, you're gonna get it from SACAM. But because you're already a scholar from whatever the scholarship you got, second will generate a financial guarantee that how you will be able to finalize your acceptance in that research. Uh, okay, again, thank you so much, doctor, for taking time out of your day to give us this lecture. It's very informative and you answered all our questions. So thank you so much. No problem, thanks for having me. If you have any questions, this is my email address and you know, can email me at any time. Okay, thank you.